Thanks everyone for joining us for the May 2021 Wetland Professionals Association Forum. But today's topic is on MINFRAG, responding to invasive Phragmites. Developing a strategy to control invasive Phragmites in Minnesota began with understanding its distribution in the state as well as its means of spread. Staff from the U of M, along with agency partners, work to increase awareness of this relatively new invasive species and use crowdsourcing to document its distribution. Currently, grant funding has been secured to begin a comprehensive control effort throughout the state. Another aspect of working with invasive Phragmites in Minnesota is to provide guidance to wastewater treatment facilities using invasive Phragmites to transition to other technologies to ultimately eliminate potential spread from these facilities. So our speaker today is Julie Bonin, and Julie is a researcher at the U of M, where she got her master's degree. Um, Julie is involved in both research and teaching related to ecological restoration and invasive species management. Julia's current research involving non-native Phragmites australis, the common reed, has several facets. One is to document populations in Minnesota. Two, to work with agency staff to facilitate a coordinated control effort. Uh, part three is to work with wastewater treatment facilities to transition away from the use of invasive Phragmites. And Four is to work with the U of M researchers to screen native Phragmites for use as an alternative for biosolids dewatering in wastewater treatment facilities. Julia also facilitates learning in a series of online ecological restoration courses offered through Extension that are targeted to early career professionals. She has 14 years of project management experience from the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum where she was responsible for restoring, managing, and monitoring the Springkeeper Meadow, which was a landscape scale ecological restoration. So um, we'd like to welcome Julia. All right, thanks for having me, everybody. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you about Phragmites. As wetland professionals, some of you may already have encountered um, invasive Phragmites in your work. And possibly, I haven't seen any names pop up that I've been communicating with about Phragmites, um, but it's not too unlikely that some of you have been communicating with me about that, reporting populations, or maybe you're going to be some of the people who I'll work with to get some management done. Um, but this is a program that we've been working on since 2017 at the U of M, and we've dubbed it MinFrag, Minnesota Phragmites. And so our effort was initially to find out where Phragmites was in the state so that we could um, understand its distribution and figure out what to do about it. So I'm working with a pretty large team, I'd say. Um, our, you know, our kind of close network of the team includes Dan Larkin, also at the University of Minnesota, and Wendy Kroll at the Department of Natural Resources. And then, of course, there are other people in the Department of Ag and DNR that we're working pretty closely with. and um, other people at um, other agencies that are will be helping out our effort as well. Um, all right, so the Phragmites Research Project. Um, we initially started um, needing to figure out where is Phragmites distributed in Minnesota. And so that's the part where we did the crowdsourcing, step one. And then a couple other things that we were going to work on were to understand how it was spreading. We weren't sure if it was spreading by seed in Minnesota, so we wanted to explore that a little more. And then we also didn't understand the genetic diversity that we might have in Minnesota. And that actually plays into whether or not um, it's developing viable seed in Minnesota. So that was important to learn and understand. And then um, the, those three steps we've already kind of done over the last couple of years, 2017 to 2019. And now we're moving into the facilitating the management stage of the response. And then we're also working more closely now with the wastewater treatment facilities to help them transition away from using um, invasive Phragmites in their reed beds. And I'll talk about those things a little bit more here as we go. Okay, I think I just advanced two there, but um, this was supposed to be a mystery, but I've spelled it out there. Um, there are there is native Phragmites in Minnesota. You're probably very familiar with. There's actually a lot of it. It's very well distributed throughout most of the state. 
maybe not so much in southeastern Minnesota, but there's certainly some throughout the state. Um, but if you go to some parts of the state, there's a lot of it. And so one of the things that we're concerned about is that people might treat, misidentify it and treat native Phragmites and diminish our native populations in, in our wetlands. And so we don't want that to happen, but this is one of the problems with um, understanding the distribution of invasive Phragmites is because they can be difficult to distinguish from one another. There are some populations that are very clearly invasive and very clearly native, but there are some that are a little bit in between. Um, so one of the, I mean, multiple reasons why we care about invasive Phragmites being in Minnesota, as with many other invasive species, it reduces um, plant diversity and the diversity of native plants in, in plant communities, including in wetland communities in particular here, um, and thereby degrades wildlife habitat. But it also has, um, so it has those ecological impacts, but it also has economic impacts. And so it can impact transportation and agricultural infrastructure. Um, in particular, if you think about transportation, one of the things that the DOT is particularly concerned about is maintaining the safety of roads. And they do that through a lot of measures. But a lot of that is vegetation management in the roadsides um, so that they can maintain sight lines. And if somebody does have an accident, they're gonna land somewhere that's not too um, hazardous. Um, so managing um, Phragmites in roadside ditches, because roadside ditches are kind of uh, pseudo wetlands, that's one of the places where it's commonly found. Um, and then agricultural infrastructure, so out in western Minnesota where they've dug a lot of ditches to um, drain their agricultural fields to increase their productivity, that productivity can be diminished or it could cost more to maintain that because they have to uh, maintain um, the ditches to get rid of invasive Phragmites, so it potentially could cost money to do that. And then it also impacts recreational access to lakes, wetlands, rivers. You can imagine that it would be growing right, right along the road sho or um, shorelines, and um, you wouldn't be able to get your boat in, for example. It can reduce property values and impact the aesthetics of um, recreational properties or residential properties, commercial properties. And because of its um, biomass, it increases fire risk on properties where it might get out of control. I have the three images on the bottom and I would point out that um, the middle one is wild rice. And that I think was one of the real, um, I think it was the real push and an important reason why we got some funding to do the efforts that we've been making um, because there, there is a lot of concern about you know, wild rice is already being impacted by water quality issues, habitat availability. And so if wild, or if the invasive Phragmites were to get into wild rice habitat, that would be pretty detrimental, um, another blow to wild rice production in Minnesota. So one of the things we need to understand initially was how Phragmites spreads, and it spreads in four different ways. So up in the top, um, left corner, um, you can see the rhizomes here. This photograph is actually from down on the Platte River in Nebraska, where Sue Galadowicz had done some research on invasive Phragmites down there. And the river has washed away the soils um, and exposed these rhizomes. I've not seen this anywhere in Minnesota, but um, I hope it doesn't happen. But any of those rhizomes are about an inch in diameter. So they're, they're pretty thick and substantive. And um, so that's one of the ways they can spread. You can imagine if you have these exposed, exposed rhizomes, pieces could break off, be transported down the river or float through water, land somewhere else, and the population can spread that way. In the top right corner, um, this is Brandon up in Duluth, and he's holding a stolen. And this is Jeffrey over here. He's holding the other end of the stolen. A stolon is an above-ground horizontal stem, while a rhizome over here is a, an underground horizontal stem. So these above-ground stems, as well as the below-ground stems, have the capability of producing roots and shoots, so they can propagate in that manner. And you'll notice that this one is along this railroad corridor, and I wouldn't be a bit surprised if pieces of this, they, it was certainly growing across the railroad tracks, but I think it's quite likely that when that happens, pieces of it can get snapped off, popped up into the train, caught in the train or something, and shifted down that railroad corridor to um, land in another damp spot and sprout and grow there. Down here in the bottom right, um, this is actually just a, a section of a stem that I cut off. It's about 15 inches of stem with two nodes on it, and actually maybe even more nodes, but at least two. 
And after about 15 days in a bucket of water, it was sprouting these shoots and roots. So um, I would point out that particularly where we see um, Phragmites growing in roadsides, um, it's very likely that this happens when Phragmites might get mowed during the summertime while the stems are fresh and green and they have the capability of sprouting like this. So it would be easy to imagine that getting moved down roadside corridors via mowing. And then lastly, it can reproduce by seeds. So we weren't sure if that could happen in Minnesota because we A, don't have very much Phragmites, and B, um, we thought possibly the climate was a little too harsh for it to have a long enough growing season to, to develop seeds. But unfortunately, we found out that not all populations are producing viable seed, but at least some of them do. And I'll talk a little bit more about that again, too. So here's um, some non-native Phragmites, and it is considered a cryptic invader because it has, you know, that counterpart, the native Phragmites in Minnesota. But you'll notice that there's a guy standing there. I don't know if you caught that right away, but he is six feet tall, and this is a good two times as tall as he is. But some of the seed heads alone are about 18 inches long. And so this is a pretty substantial plant. I've never seen any of the native Phragmites look quite this robust. But on the other hand, the invasive Phragmites is not always this robust either. Sometimes it's only about eight to 10 feet tall. Um, so it's quite variable in its stature as well. And so that's um, some of our concern in trying to figure out um, where it is, is that we have to make that distinguish, distinguish it. So we have developed a, a, an identification guide and that's on our website. You can see the address on the bottom of the, the screen. You could find that there and download the whole ID guide. But there are a few characteristics that we use to um, distinguish between the native and the invasive Phragmites. For the native Phragmites, I always think N, native, is naked. So the stems are naked on the native Phragmites. So the native ones here, this beautiful chestnut red, they're glossy and smooth. So my touch test works pretty good on that. If you go up and you just touch it and you can see a little shine on it and you touch it and it's really smooth and it has this chestnut red color. Sometimes that color is not quite as bright as that, but um, it's always glossy and smooth. But this is actually a piece of the stem, a section of the stem that is not covered by the sheath. So here's a piece of the sheath rising up there. And there's always gonna be a, a gap somewhere. It might be a little shorter than this sometimes but there'll be a gap where there's a section of stem that's not covered by the sheath, so it's naked. And in the winter, these the leaf sheaths fall off as well, and so that leaves the stem even more naked. In contrast, the invasive species has the sheath that covers the stem, and it overlaps with the sheath above it. So you can see where the leaf blade is going off, and then the sheath extending down, right down to the, where the next leaf blade goes off, and then there's the next sheath. And if you were to um, scratch your thumbnail along this, you would feel it ridges like corduroy. And then on the leaf sheaths a little bit more, I wanted to just show you an image where you could see the leaf sheath more clearly on the naked. This is the sheath, but it's open and still exposes the stem and you can easily catch your thumb in that and flick that. Gaps away from the stem. For the invasive, the, the sheaths are very tight and they overlap, as I mentioned, and they remain intact over the winter, whereas these will fall off on the native in wintertime. Another characteristic that I use that I feel is very strong characteristic for identifying and distinguishing the two species, the native has a smudgy red-brown actual flap of tissue, and that tissue has a little ragged fringe of hairs on the top of it. And sometimes it's a little bit graphite in color, but it's about a millimeter or more tall. In contrast, the invasive Phragmites has a ligule, which is basically just a line with a fringe of hairs on it. So the colored part of it um, is just a line. There's always this um, discrete kind of brownish line in there. And the ligule is described as being less than a millimeter tall. So where is a ligule if you were to look for one? So if you're at the pull a leaf back here, I always grab one of these leaves. If you pull it back right in the corner here where the leaf blade attaches to the top of the leaf sheath, the ligule is in the inside right up against the stem. 
And so this is what it would look like if you pull that apart on a native one. I can see that flap of tissue. Unfortunately, this photo is not very clear, but um, you can see the flap of tissue is kind of tall. And from here, I would be able to identify that if somebody sent me that picture, I'd say that's native. And then this is a photo that was taken by one of my colleagues in MnDOT who sends me stuff to verify. And these are clearly um, just that discrete line with the fringe of hairs on it that tells me that that is a ligule of an invasive Phragmites. So um, for reporting Phragmites, we're encouraging um, people to use the EdMaps Pro app. And it's really great because you can download some pictures. It puts the location in there. You don't have to kind of guess or figure out coordinates. It just does it automatically for you. Um, you can note the habitat and the size of the population. And um, what I encourage people to do is if you um, are not sure, report it. And then what happens is I will go in to the EdMaps and I will verify it based on the great pictures that you're going to send in. So you'll send in some pictures of the lower stem, the ligule, the whole patch. And that way, with a combination of those pictures, I can pretty much tell um, and verify those populations right away and add them to our list for control in the state. And if you had any questions and you were uncertain, then you could email me information. And then I would submit the report if it turns out to be um, an invasive population. Either way, it would work great. One thing that's also nice about the EdMaps Pro app, and I encourage you to use it if you're out and you might find some that you could report for us, um, if you have the app on your phone and you drive up to a spot and you are alarmed because there's this very tall grass that you think doesn't look quite right, um, you can pull up the app and it will show you if there's a reported population already adjacent to where you are. So these red dots are all, um, this is right out in Wright County, and these are all populations of invasive phragmites that have already been reported. So if you have this app, then we don't have, um, and you pull it up and use it like that, then we won't get duplicate reports of the populations that have previously been documented. So it's great for that, and I encourage you to use it that way. All right, so what does Phragmites look like in terms of where it's at in Minnesota? This is the map of um, where populations are. You can see there are some areas that are where it's very concentrated, and then some areas where we have random scattered populations outstate Minnesota. Um, we have just over 600 populations that have been verified to date, um, and more keep trickling in. Um, this is up about 200 populations since 2019 when we finished our kind of first two years of our grant. Um, so we think just with exposure to more people learning about it that we're finding more. And then also it's definitely spreading, you know, in that interim time. You know, there might have been some little satellite populations that had just started. And then they eventually got to a recognizable stage of growth where they were flowering. Um, its status, its regulatory status, was just changed to a prohibited control noxious weed in Minnesota. And that's great news for us as we plan to move ahead and do control. We'll get a lot more cooperation from landowners because they have to manage it. And we actually have funding. So now we can um, use that as um, some bait to say, well, we. You know, you have it, it needs to be managed, but we can pay for it. So it, there's not going to be a burden over the next couple of years for people to do the management and control of it. So I think we'll get some good cooperation to get out and do that. But as a prohibited control, it must be controlled on all lands in a way that prevents spread by seed or vegetative means. And recall that vegetative means uh, it can spread by every part of the plant during the growing season. So um, it must be controlled in general. Here's a map with just with the uh, wastewater treatment facilities that are using the invasive reeds. There are two of the um, facilities, Mora and Avon, are using um, native reeds. And then 10 are using actively using right now the invasive reeds. And five have recently or um, in the last 10 years removed their um, invasive reeds and will try to operate their beds as drying beds instead of the invasive reeds. So um, it's been really kind of fascinating. I never thought when I started working with Phragmites that I would actually get pretty engaged in wastewater treatment facilities, but it's been um, pretty interesting to work with the operators and try to figure out how to prevent spread from the reed beds. Um, we, weren't a, we didn't access the beds. It's a little bit of a um, touchy subject because they spent a lot of money to build facilities that would use reed beds. And some of these facilities 
were only installed quite recently. And it would be, it is going to be very costly to um, transition to something else. So this has become a little bit of a um, sensitive subject um, and has to be dealt with a little bit carefully. So they have been, um, I wouldn't say grandfathered in, but the facilities that are still using the invasive reed will have a transition period. And with the understanding that when there are suitable alternatives to the invasive reed, that at that time they would have to transition away from invasive reed and use an alternative species or use drying beds or some other technology to dry the sewage sludge. So the, the reeds are very good because of their great mass at removing water from the sewage sludge out in these large beds. Let's say a bed would be 50 by 100 feet and some of the facilities might have, you know, five beds or eight beds, something like that. So give you a sense of what that looks like. And then relative to where those are, um, this is where the populations of invasive phragmites are. And certainly um, the, the wastewater treatment facilities are not the only mode of introduction and dispersal. So I think some of the other sources are wetland restoration. So for example, out in Candy, Ohio County, the, there's a, a pr private property owner who did a wetland restoration thinking he was doing a great thing. And he got some seed from Wisconsin that probably had um, invasive phragmites in the seed mix. Um, roadside mowing certainly is one way it's moving around, railroads as well. Um, we see a lot in the metro area around construction of stormwater ponds and highway construction seem to be moving it. So those are some of the other modes in, with which it's moving. I would also note that something like these populations up here in Lake of the Woods County, I don't have on this map, but there are a lot of populations over the border in Canada as well. And so they probably came in along that railroad corridor into um, Minnesota. But in the landscape, we find Phragmites um, primarily along roadsides and on lake shores and wetlands. So those are, all have high, pretty, percent, pretty high percentages of the known populations. Um, lake shores actually had been the higher um, number of populations until recently. We've been finding more along roadsides that bump that number up. The lake shore concentration is pretty high because, and it's largely driven by populations in Chisago County where they have one of the wastewater treatment facilities that is using it. And um, it, it, it's quite likely that the spread from the facility is the source of the populations along, along the lakes. So this is an example here, this lakeshore picture where you can see the, um, the common reed in the background here behind this landowner's dock. And so as that continues to spread, he's not going to be very happy about that. Um, this is Chisago County as well, and this is in a stormwater pond in a development. So that is a lower um, percentage of the populations. And then other would be things like um, industrial sites, for example, that would have. Um, so, for example, we have a lot of populations up in Duluth that are along kind of the, um, the shoreline shipyard kind of area. So those are pretty industrial. And then there are a couple of waste for uh, surprisingly, um, cement plants, just because they use a lot of water and somehow the Phragmites got there and it's quite happy in those situations. Um, how big is the problem? So we're optimistic that the problem is actually not very big. 600 may sound like a lot of populations, but most of them are still pretty small. So they're 57% of the populations are less than a thousand square feet. That's less than a tennis court, for example, which is 2,800 square feet, I think. So if that gives you a little perspective on area. Uh, we do have a few that are larger that it will be concerning um, to get adequate control of those. Um, we have to have somebody with the proper equipment to get into these larger areas with all this vegetation and get above it to get um, herbicide application on the population. Um, and then we have um, a few populations where we don't know the area just because the records didn't have that. I think some of these populations that are larger than 10,000 square feet are going to be smaller because um, some people reported um, the whole area where the infestation occurred as opposed to just the area of the infestation. So transitioning to reproductive potential. So we were concerned that um, we didn't know where it might be producing seed. Um, but we found out, we just sampled our populations and we found out that we're pretty good up in the northern third of the state. We don't really have um, viable populations up there to our knowledge. Of course, there were very few populations. We were only able to sample at that time four populations, but we do, we found more in the meantime, but 
Um, at the time we did the sampling, there weren't very many populations in that area. Uh, it's more concerning down the southern two-thirds of the state. Um, there are more populations. More populations means that the plants can cross-pollinate. They're self-incompatible, so they have to cross-pollinate to be able to produce viable seed. So with the density of populations and then possibly because of climate, we don't for sure know which um, is more limiting or if both are somewhat limiting. Um, but nonetheless, we do have populations in the south that are producing viable seeds. So we're concerned that we would want to get these treated before the population density increases enough that we might have greater production of viable seed in this area. And there's a little bit of evidence that we may have, so preliminary results, I would say, suggest that we have um, invasive Phragmites or, excuse me, Phragmites hybrids in Minnesota. Um, so I'd like to repeat this because a couple of the populations, I actually had a hard time believing that they could be um, hybrid, where, just based on where they were located. Um, so I'd like to repeat that and make sure I provided the, the raw material for these for this analysis and then a postdoc did the work. But um, just to be clear, it'd be good to repeat this before we, um, you know, absolutely say there are hybrids in Minnesota, but there is evidence that there may be. And so um, we've now moved on to the point now. Um, we had some funding last year and because of COVID, we weren't able to um, roll it out and get the response going. Um, we had some glitches that just made it difficult for us to coordinate um, with the contractor and with um, contracts and stuff like that. Um, but we are more on the ball this year and our plan is to get out and um, we have a contractor lined up, we have funding. And so we have the expertise and the, the funding in place. The contractor has the specialized equipment that will potentially be needed. And we have permitting, um, working, we're working through the DOT, the DNR to get permitting in all locations going. And then um, we'll have local um, contacts help us with property access and permissions to do that. So th those are some of the capacity issues that we needed to iron out last year and we feel like we've got that going this year, so we'll be ready to move ahead. And I would note I illustrated this slide with um, the, the different levels of equipment that might be needed to um, manage Phragmites. And so a couple of these images are from not too far away from us, but not in Minnesota, thank goodness, yet. So a helicopter um, is a method that they would be using over in Wisconsin or Michigan or out on the East Coast where Phragmites is much worse than it is here in Minnesota. And um, we don't have any populations where we'd be bringing anything out as large as a helicopter to do treatments. It's possible we have a couple populations where we might use something like a marsh master so that we can again get up over a large patch and get the herbicide onto it more evenly. Um, and that would only be a few populations, but our contractor has um, access to that kind of equipment if it should be needed. More of our populations are gonna be, you know, a tank with a hose and reel on the back of an ATV or a truck or something like that, UTV. And then a few populations where we might be going in and hand wicking even, or using a backpack sprayer. So that's the good news. Most of our populations are tank on a truck or tractor or backpack kind of size populations. We're still in a good state that way. So regarding um, best management practices, um, we recommend before any treatment happens that populations get um, positively ID'd as invasive Phragmites. Um, we'll be working and cooperating with our partners to get permits in place. We have just one licensed applicator we're going to be trying to work with, and we hope that it's not too much work. It, hopefully we'll have a good weather fall so that um, they don't have too many down days. But if they do have a down day in one area, um, because they are the same applicator that will be treating in another area, it's possible they could just go to a different part of the state and do treatment there. Um, it'll be important to use best practices to avoid further spread of um, invasive Phragmites propagules, whether it's vegetative or seed. Then the, um, the treatment, um, we have some protocols in place. It'll be, I'll talk about that in a little bit here. And then as with all um, invasive species management, there should be follow-up, monitoring and follow-up. Um, there, we anticipate that it would be three years of treatment to um, control any given population. And so we want to, um, we hope to have money in place to, to be able to pay for those treatments even. Um, we, we think we have it for two years lined up, but we hope to have it for the three. 
And then some of the larger populations may need re active revegetation as well, so that we don't have big holes in the um, vegetation that just um, provide a source for new infestations of that, you know, more reed or something else. And a lot of this information can be found, again, on um, the MACERC website. You can get there by doing minfrag.org, or you can go to use this address. Our management recommendations, if some of you might um, find yourself needing to manage invasive Phragmites, in year one, um, there's an optional mowing, a fall herbicide, evaluate, and then an optional winter mow knockdown. So the, the mowing or knockdown are optional because if the population is smaller, it may not need that. But for some of the larger populations, it's helpful to knock down the old dead stems. They're very um, woody. They're like um, kind of lightweight bamboo. And so they do persist and they stand up um, pretty well. And so if you knock those down, then more of your herbicide treatment is going to land on fresh green growth instead of on these old dead stems. So the treatment should be more effective. And in year two, there will be um, more evaluation, follow-up treatment very likely, and then more evaluation. The evaluation after a treatment is to go in even a week or two after and see how effective your treatment was. If you had any large skip areas, you might be able to retreat it even that same year. So we think that's a, a good step to follow up immediately and see how effective your treatment was and see if you have any um, issues. And then year two and three going in and treating again, most likely. And you can evaluate um, in year two, you can go in too early. Um, if you go in in June, you may not see the growth because it'll have been impacted by the first treatment and it may not be very um, vigorous. And so it may have delayed emergence. So don't we recommend not going in to do that evaluation until at least July to be sure that you know whether or not you actually have something that you're going to have to follow up on with the treatment. And glyphosate and amazapir appear, appear to be the most effective herbicides. This is um, data based on pulling data out of different papers. Um, so there's actually a pretty small sample size here, you'll notice. But um, it, based on the studies that were done, amazapir was slightly more effective um, had a more efficacy, greater efficacy than glyphosate. Um, and it tended to be just a little bit more concentrated up here around a 95% median versus 87 with a broader variation in effectiveness for glyphosate. Combination of the two of them was also a very good, um, had a good response. In terms of timing, fall is the most effective timing for um, herbicide treatment of invasive Phragmites. And this is true of a lot of invasive species where you need the chemical to get down into the rhizomes to affect um, control of the rhizomes as well. Um, and so we'll see um, the fall glyphosate had a very broad a median of 91, but a pretty broad effect. Um, summer glyphosate was a little bit lower median. And then the fall amazapir uh, was had a high median effect efficacy of 96% control. Um, summer slightly less. So we're going to try to get our contractors to not go out before mid-August. Um, ideally, I think the window should be late August to um, into early October. But um, because of all the populations we need to control, we'll probably push it a little bit earlier, you know, like maybe mid-August to do our treatments this coming season and see how that goes. Um, and then that fall application just had, um, if we look at this last one, fall and mazapir just had a more suppressive effect than um, summer treatments of either glyphosate or mazapir or even the fall um, glyphosate treatment. We recommend um, mazapir for at least the first application, if not the first and the second, because it has that longer residual in the soil. So it'll have a, a longer term suppressive effect and control effect. Um, and then if you're treating again in the third year, um, we'd recommend using glyphosate because you'll be able to go back in sooner to do any revegetation that might be necessary. Or if active revegetation isn't necessary, then you'd be able to, um, you know, plants would be able to fill back in from the surrounding area sooner and faster.
Um, so yeah, they're both um, both chemicals are non-selective. Um, they both have an aquatic approved um, format or format formation. That's not the word I mean. Um, form. They both have a, an aquatic form. Um, Amazapir is a little bit higher cost and it wouldn't be recommended for high quality areas. So we do have a couple of areas where there are really nice aquatic plants around and adjacent to. Um, and so we would probably just more carefully use glyphosate in those areas. Um, and if you use the Amazapir, as I noted, you would have to wait before you could do the revegetation because of the longer persistence that it has. All right, so that's what I had. And so I think hopefully I've left enough time for some questions. Yes, um, we have one question here. It is, is your team planning on treating all 600 sites this year or a subset? Um, our strategy is to try to treat all of the outstate populations because we feel like if we can bring it back to the core of where the Phragmites is, that would be ideal. Um, but we do actually, we're actually optimistic that we could treat everything this year if everything goes well. But we are using just one contractor. And the reason for that is just because of the, it's, the funding is with the DNR. And so we had to go through their um, contractor budgeting process. And there was only one bid. Um, for this contract. And so the company, it's Clark Company, they happen to be a pretty large company, a nationwide company. So we think they have the capacity to do it. Um, they may be bringing in people from other um, of their um, branch companies. Um, so they hopefully will be able to do all the treatment. But you know, if we get a really rainy fall, that'll shut us down, I think, pretty quick. I would note that there are um, there are already efforts to do control. So on the one map that I showed, there was there were yellow um, icons as well, and those were previously treated populations. Um, so some counties are doing some of the treatment themselves. In some areas, MnDOT is doing some of the treatment, but you know MnDOT it hadn't been a prohibited noxious weed until this winter, so they didn't have to treat it. So some of the districts had not prioritized it, um, but I think um, that will change a little bit now. And then, for example, in Chisago County, the Lakes Association um, really rallied and have done all of the treatment around the lakes, but they haven't extended to the populations out along the roadsides and in the landscape that around the lakes. So there has been um, quite a bit of effort already, and some of those entities will probably continue to do their treatment and we'll let them keep doing their part, and then we'll just pick up some of the slack. But it is our um, goal to try to treat everything this year, and we'll just see exactly how far we can get. Great. Good luck. Thank um, you. <laughs> so how does the native Phragmites work for wastewater treatment plants compared to the invasive Phragmites? Okay, that's a really good question. So the two facilities in um, Minnesota that are using the native, the one didn't even know he had native Phragmites. He knew he had a reed bed. He thought he had invasive Phragmites, but when I went to look at it, it was um, native. And so it, it might be that he was not the operator when it was installed, so he just didn't know. But his bed, what happens with the, the native Phragmites, as you as wetland scientists and professionals probably know, is that it doesn't actually grow very densely and it plays nicely with its companion plants. So like there's room amongst native Phragmites for other things to grow. You can see very large patches of it, acres and acres, but it tends to allow other things to grow in its midst, as opposed to invasive Phragmites, which does not allow other things to grow in its midst. It is a very dense um, colony of plants. And so when native Phragmites is in the reed beds, it actually is a little bit less effective or perhaps, and it's some percentage less effective, we don't know exactly how much less, just because there's more space amongst the plants and the plants aren't as, um, they don't have as much biomass, so therefore they're not transpiring away as much water. So they are not as effective, but um, nonetheless, we're gonna proceed with that because it's another wetland plant. It has the right characteristics of being able to um, basically kind of sucker. So it, with the reed beds, you're filling them constantly with sludge. And so you're getting basically a sedimentation effect um, over time. You're having this deposit on top of the, the rhizomes. And the plants, because of that ability to um, send out roots and shoots from the nodes, 
can um, continue to send out roots and shoots near the surface and grow through that sedimentation process that they're experiencing. So we think that the native Phragmites will be able to do that as well. There are um, a couple, there are three facilities in northern Wisconsin that just transitioned to native Phragmites as well. And then Mora is the other one in Minnesota. So they're all actually at the stage of kind of just getting established right now. So it's the jury is still out on whether those operators are finding it effective enough for their facilities. Um, one more question. Uh, what does funding look like in the future? Do you have criteria for sites that would need revegetation? Right now, we're not focused on the revegetation. We hope that if we do treatment on um, properties that need revegetation, that there will be maybe some other sources of funding for that. Um, maybe local county kind of funding or something. Um, if we had additional funding after we do a round of treatment in any given year, we might be able to roll some of it into revegetation. Um, but yeah, that'll be something that we will definitely keep our eye on and figure out how to address if it's if we find that it's needed, which I certainly in some areas we'll find that it will be needed. Okay, and then I had a question. Um, you mentioned the Phragmites in Wisconsin, Michigan, and the East Coast. How are those regions doing in their management and what risk do those Phragmite populations pose to Minnesota? Yeah, I think it's found in most states to some extent. So like Iowa for sure has some. Um, I don't know, I haven't seen good maps of it. You know, in Minnesota, we're often proactive if, um, <laughs> with some of our natural resource issues more than some of the states surrounding us. And so this is one where we've made a really big effort. And like in Minnesota, somebody decided let's fund a point person and that that's me. Um, so we have like somebody pushing to get something done. And then, you know, we have people on board who secured funding for the treatment and stuff like that. So in Minnesota, the situation is looking pretty good, but certainly could be affected by our neighbors. In Wisconsin, what's happened is kind of interesting. The western part of Wisconsin looks like a, a lot like Minnesota, outstate Minnesota, where there are random scattered populations. They also have about 15 wastewater treatment facilities, as I recall, that are using invasive Phragmites. So the three of them up north got transitioned out because those are all um, there was tribal influence in that decision. They didn't, they're concerned about their rice waters up north. And so they wanted to address it and they got on it and just decided they were gonna swap them out. It cost about $3 million, um, but they got it done. Um, but in, so in Western Minnesota, the, the density of invasive phragmites is a lot like Minnesota. But if you move to the Eastern side of Wisconsin, it's actually kind of, what we would consider out of control. It's maybe so established in the landscape that they will have to um, prioritize what populations they're gonna control and manage and have some of it will not get managed, I think. And so they actually have a dual um, um, regulatory status for it too. In um, Western Wisconsin, it was restricted noxious weed and in, um, no, or vice versa, maybe it's prohibited over in Western and then restricted in um, Eastern Wisconsin. So they have a dual um, strategy for, you know, deciding and prioritizing even what parts of the state will have to be managed and where it will um, be, you know, up to the different local land managers to decide. Out on the East Coast, it's been established out there for 150 some years. So it's um, impacting estuaries on the East Coast. Um, it's an eco ecological engineer in the sense that it, it creates land just by virtue of its biomass and the roots, so it can basically dewater a wetland. And in the East Coast, they actually, you may have heard this in the news even, that they actually um, aren't all sad that they have it now with climate change and rising sea levels. The um, invasive Phragmites out there might pro provide a little bit of a buffer for them against um, storm surge and things like that. So that's how well established it is out there, unfortunately, but in some ways fortunate. The interesting juxtaposition. Well, I can speak for all Minnesotans right. and say uh, we're very lucky to have you as our point person. So thank you for that. Happy um, to do it. But that is all the questions I have here.
Anybody should feel free to get in touch with me um, if you have further questions or if you want to learn anything more about Frag Mighties, I'm a wealth of information. And if not, I can point you, if I don't know it, I can help get you in the right direction. But I really appreciate that you all uh, came in to learn more about it today. Yes, thank you. Colleen, do you have any closing comments? I would just say thanks, Julia, for your talk and information and thanks, Jack, for facilitating. And thanks to everyone for attending today.